You're listening to the Life with Old Dogs podcast, and I'm your host, Dawn Memna, primary caretaker of all of our wonderful senior German Shepherds right here at Woody's Place Senior German Shepherd Sanctuary. Hey there, and welcome back. All right, just to recap, last week um, in the Life with Old Dogs podcast, I covered the markers that we use to help us determine when it's time to say goodbye to one of the residents of Woody's Place. And when I say that, I mean um, help them across the Rainbow Bridge. Um, We talked about mobility, mobility. frequency of accidents happening inside the house, and um, appetite. They're they're some of the markers that we use to help us determine when it's time to say goodbye. Um, typically, um, Typically, when we're looking at markers like that, we're not talking about a resident who has um, an illness that comes on quickly. Um, we're talking about one of our uh, geriatric, geriatric residents, if you will, one that is is more or less like slipping away um, due to age, and it's a gradual thing as opposed to uh, it happening suddenly. So covered all that in last week's episode. You can go back and listen to it if you like. Um, this week, I'm going over. I'm going over actually. The part where the part where you actually say goodbye and what to expect. So, all right, you've you've made it to this point. You've you've made probably one of the hardest decisions you're you're ever going to make. The most hardest but humane decisions you're you're ever going to make. You realize that um, your dog is really not doing well. Uh, his or her quality of life isn't slipping away. It has slipped away. And and now you realize that it's time. It's time to help your fur friend across um, the Rainbow Bridge and, and find peace. And, and that's hard. It really is. As I said, it's one of the hardest decisions most people make. Um, and... It's loaded with anticipatory grief. Uh, so I covered this in in a Life with All Dogs blog post some time ago, uh, grief and coping with the loss of your fur friend. And I touched base on anticipatory grief. There's, there's tragic grief and there's anticipatory grief. And tragic grief is when something horrific happens suddenly that causes you to grieve. Uh, Perhaps a loved one had a heart attack and and died. And that's it. You know, it it just happens suddenly. And that's, that's tragic grief. It's it's usually um, shocking. Anticipatory grief is is different. Anticipatory grief is It's just that you're anticipating that you're going to grieve. You know, it's coming. You know, this heartache is coming. You know, you're going to mourn the loss of, of someone or, or something. And it's, it's going to hurt. So you're loaded with anticipatory grief because you know, this is, this is coming. And I'll be sure to include the link to the blog that I was just telling you about in the show notes. Anyway, so you have that. But then, you know, you may also have doubt, too, because I I think this is one of the biggest things that um, people who have older dogs struggle with. The when, when, how do I know? Well, we went over how, um, but here's the thing. You know, you, you can have those markers put in place and... You know, like I said, you could see like they're not going downhill, but they've gone downhill. And let's just say it's like a Wednesday and you make an appointment with a veterinarian for euthanasia the following, you know, Monday, let's just say. And then all of a sudden on Saturday, they have a great day. (laughs) 
You know, I mean, they're they're up, they're moving, they're eating, they, they seem to have a little spark of life, they're happy. And, uh, you know, it, it makes you, you doubt then your decision. And, you know, you start thinking, well, maybe, maybe I'm doing this too soon. Maybe, maybe I should wait a little bit longer. I mean, there's nothing like horrifically wrong, but they're just not doing so great. Um, been there, done that. And, um, and I've heard people experience that same situation that make them then doubt whether they're making the right decision or not. So here's here's my piece on that. It's better to say goodbye a day too soon than a day too late. Yes, I understand they could have had a good day, but we've never had any resident here who's gone on then to have a good week after that a good month after that, a good half year after that. It, it just doesn't happen. It's just like kind of like a flash in the pan. They, they have a good moment and then it's gone again. So if you've, if you've discussed the situation with people in your household who know and love your dog very well and they can say, yep, yes, we're making the right decision here, or a majority of the people feel like you're all making the right decision. Um, if if you don't have people in your household to help you make that determination, you speak, you speak with your vet, and she helps you decide, yes, this is probably the best course of action. It, it doesn't really make sense to put it off any longer. That helps you with that doubt. Um, but it's there. It, it's always there. I mean, I've I've been doing this for a long time, Life with Old Dogs and um, Woody's Place Senior German Shepherd Sanctuary. And believe me, I still have doubts sometimes. But I now have learned to recognize that it's better a day too soon than a day too late. So you have anticipatory grief and doubt. All right. The decision's made. It's the day of the appointment. Now, there there's... Okay, euthanasia can go like a couple ways. You can have an in-home euthanasia or you can have an in-office euthanasia. So obviously in-home euthanasia is exactly what it says. That's when your vet comes to the home and goes through the euthanasia process there in the comfort of your own home. Now, we, we're we not that lucky where we are to have a situation like that. I mean, there there are veterinarians, uh, mobile veterinarians creeping closer to our area that, you know, offer home euthanasia in the next county over. But, you know, I don't know if they would come here or not. And um, in another county over, there's there's a home vet that I know offers in-home euthanasia. And I actually contacted her one time over a year ago, maybe two years ago now, about an in-home euthanasia. And when she found out it was for the sanctuary, she said, no, she doesn't work with rescue dogs. And that that really offended me. I wasn't asking for a financial break or anything like that. So that that uh, that upset me. And um, yeah. I won't use her now in the future, but we are in a um, a rural area. I've, I've talked about this before. It's a, a rural agricultural area in the lake region of the Pocono Mountains in Pennsylvania. So we don't have, you know, uh, we don't have a whole lot of um, veterinary practices like right here in our our immediate area. In fact, I ch- I travel forty minutes to go to um, the veterinary practice we use. Um, but anyway, maybe someday we will have the option to have in-home euthanasia readily available, but unfortunately we don't right now. But if you do, that is the route I would go for sure. Um, and then there is in-office euthanasia, and that is basically where you pack your dog up and you drive to the veterinarian office just like you would if you were going there for you know a regular appointment and then the euthanasia is done there. So the appointment's made, not sure if you're, you know, going to do an in-home or in-office euthanasia, but regardless of where, I would strongly suggest that any member of the family who loves that dog is, is given the opportunity to say goodbye and be present if they, if they so choose. 
even even children, and I, I mean older children, um, or or children who may be younger, but you feel maybe mature enough to handle um, the transition of euthanasia. Um, now, if you have you know a toddler or something like that, I'm I'm going to say no. It's probably best that they're they're not there because how can they really comprehend what's going on? But if you have um, if you have a child maybe eight, nine years old, and they're they're mature and they they understand what's happening, um, I, I think it's I think it's really important to give them the opportunity to say goodbye. And also, if they so choose to be present during the euthanasia, to, to be present. Um, the reason being is because you don't want to send that child off to school and go ahead and go through the euthanasia and then, you know, have them come home and just be shell-shocked, especially if they're mature enough to comprehend what is going on. It's it's really unfair to not even give them the opportunity to say goodbye. And it is part of life. It is part of life. And I just feel that they should be present for it. Um, but the the decision is up to you. Um, so I'm going to say any any family man- member, anyone who loves that dog, I think, again, should have the chance to say goodbye and be present if they so choose. All right. The next thing is you want to make sure your dog is, again, surrounded by loved ones. And you want to make sure that they have items that they're they're comfortable and familiar with. For instance, their bed, blankets, um, toys, like any sort of stuffed animal or something along those lines. Um, You would want them to lay on their bed. I mean, even if you do an in-office visit, take the bed with you. Take the bed, take the blanket, take the toy, take it all with you. And you want your dog to be as comfortable as possible. I mean, he's not going to get another chance at this. So you want you want your dog to be as comfortable as possible. So surrounded by loved ones and items that offer comfort and of familiarity. All right. And again, blanket, bed, toys, stuffed animals, things of that nature. As far as your dog's collar goes, leave the collar on. This is my opinion. Leave the collar on during the process because it your dog may become upset if you try to move it. This has actually happened to me um, early on when when I was I I'm the one who does um, the euthanasias for for the dogs here at the sanctuary. I mean, I'm not the one who performs them. I'm the one that goes through the process with the veterinarian to do euthanasias for the residents. And early on, for some reason, I just thought, oh, let me take their collar off and rub their neck and all that stuff. And I I, I found that more of the residents than not became very upset over that. And one even like was sniffing her collar. She wanted her collar. So I just leave the collars on until... It's all done, and then I take the collar. So, leave it on. If if your if your dog is a dog who typically wears a collar, don't don't take it off. Wait till wait till the process is over. And try to stay as calm and natural as possible. Um, you know, sit with your dog on the floor, uh, pet your dog, talk with your dog. Tell him everything you want you want to, to tell him that he's the best, he or she's the best. Thank you for being my best friend. There's never gonna be another you. I love you with all my heart. Whatever it is that you want to say, just speak softly, try to be calm, try to act naturally. Um, pay attention to your to your body language as you're petting your dog. They can feel if you're you're anxious and stressed. So try to remain as neutral as possible. Uh, light strokes or pet your, pet your dog naturally like you normally would. But definitely pay attention to how you're doing it because you may be, you, you may have such inner turmoil that you may be petting too hard or grabbing their fur without realizing it. And you don't want to do that because, because, 
you're their pet parent and they're they're looking to you for for cues and signs you know they they may know that something's going on i think a lot of them do know actually that something's going on there they're looking to you for reassurance and this is your final commitment to your beloved fur friend okay so make it count and and try to do the best you can to keep it together for them even though it, it is a very emotionally charged time I, I get it. <laughs> I, I know. I know it is. Uh, I've ugly cried more times than I care to remember during euthanasia. So I, I know it's hard to remain um, calm, but just do the best you can for your dog. So the veterinarian is she, the first thing your veterinarian is going to do is she, she may shave your dog's um, front leg, one of your dog's front leg, and she may uh, put an IV in or 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 not, um, she may just go right to injecting a sedative to keep your dog calm. So that's the first thing they do, basically, is they'll come in, they'll shave your dog's front leg, and they'll either administer an IV and put a sedative in through that, or they'll just um, forego the IV and inject a sedative into your dog, um, the reason they're doing this is to keep your dog as calm as possible during this process, which I, I think is fantastic. So years ago, they didn't do this. Years ago, a sedative was not given. They would go right to the pentobarbital and, and stop the heart and the brain function. And um, I, I have some stories about that that, you know, I, I really don't want to share um, but I am I am so relieved that they give the sedative now, and um, I do believe it's more of a commonplace in in the in the veterinary uh, practice world to give a sedative to a dog who is about ready to leave this world. Um, so so okay, what happens once they get the sedative? Well, once the sedative is administered, the dog starts to become groggy. Um, so what I've noticed is they, in like a, a couple of minutes or so, I, uh, what I notice is their, their head sort of starts to, to bob a little bit and they may drool some, um, they may develop a little nystagmus in their eyes. That's a little jiggling in the eyes. Um, their eyes may jiggle back and forth a little bit. Um, their tongue may come out of their mouth slightly, like either out the front of their mouth or out the side of their mouth. Uh, they, they definitely become um, more disoriented, it seems, as the sedative starts to work to the point then where they're, they're putting their head down like they're just ready to go to sleep. Um, some of them fight it. Some of them have bad circulation, poor circulation, and the sedative doesn't work so well. Uh, we've been in that situation where they've had to have uh, several doses of sedation um, before they reach the point where they're wanting to put their head down to go to sleep. Um, others, it really hasn't worked at all. Um, most, most, like 98% get to the point where they they put their head down like they're they're going to sleep. So that takes approximately 10 to 15 minutes. And at this point, if if you're in in the office, um, the vet or vet tech will walk in and out a few times just to see how you and your your dog are doing, but it's pretty much just family, whoever is with a dog in the room with a dog at that time. Now, once the sedation has kicked in, then the vet comes back into the room. And again, I'm, I'm talking about in-office euthanasia because we have not had in-home euthanasia here at the sanctuary. Um, so the vet will come back in. And at that point, she, she has the, the pentobarbital. That's what they use to, um, to stop the heart from beating and the brain activity um, to cease. So the pe pentobarbital is, it's a medication, I believe, for seizures. 
And I get it confused sometimes with phenobarbital, but that's also for seizures. But so pentobarbital, yeah, it's for seizures and in large doses, um, that's what it does. It stops the heart and brain activity. And it's it's very quick and painless. And f- for the dog, it, it is like they are going to sleep. So they're already pretty much out like unconscious and out from the sedation, or they should be anyway. So when your veterinarian administers the pentobarbital, again, it'll be in the front leg, just like the sedation. In just about a minute, um, your dog is then deceased. So you want to you wanna stay with your dog through this whole thing. So basically what I do is I, I make sure the dog's head is in my lap, I'm petting the dog. I'm talking to the dog. I'm I'm probably crying at this point, but I I've because I've been doing this for so long. I I pretty much can keep it together then. But it, it's typically when I leave the office that I'm just a blubbering idiot. Um, <clears throat> but I've gotten good at keeping it together for the sake of the dog. Anyway, um, so after. After the heart stops and the brain activity ceases, well, I should say while this is happening, a few things may happen. Number one, your dog may defecate and or urinate. That That is totally normal and natural. If, it's, it's, if their, their bladder's full or there's, you know, poop in their, their bowels, it's going to come out. It, it's the same with people. Um. You may also hear maybe some gurgling sounds. Uh, That is air being expelled from your dog's body, which is also natural. Their tongue may be completely hanging out of their mouth at this point, either out the front of their mouth or out the side of their mouth. That is also natural. Um, Their eyes most likely will be open. Uh, I can't think of one time that we've had a dog with their eyes shut. And I I typically close their eyes for them. Um, Sometimes their eyelids don't close all the way and they, they, you know, just come back up on their own. Um, Again, there there may be a few spasms like muscle spasms that you may notice. And and all of this is normal. All of this is, is very typical. Uh, So your vet then will listen to your dog's chest to see if there's a heartbeat and then there's not. There's typically not a heartbeat or there shouldn't be. And then your veterinarian will declare that your dog is now deceased. So, and hopefully you have stayed with your dog the entire time and, and you were talking with your dog because I do believe that they can still hear you even after their heart has stopped. Um, I believe that's true, and I I do. I don't know if it is. I don't know. It just makes me feel better, and I think, you know, it might you too. (laughs) Um, All right, so after your veterinarian has declared that your dog is deceased, most likely she will say some kind words to you and then leave the room and leave you and anyone else with you um, with the dog for a little while, they'll typically tell you, take as much time as you need. And and this is when, you know, it's totally fine if you want to become a blubbering idiot at this time. Um, you know, you just hug your dog, squeeze your dog, love your dog, because it's going to be the last time you're ever going to hold your dog. Um, I always take like a little bit of hair if I want to make, you know, uh, um, jewelry with it later or something along those lines. I don't know why. It's just me. It's a kooky thing. I take the collar and I always take a little bit of hair <laughs> from the dog. And um, I just spend probably about 15, 20 minutes with the dog. Um, just just being, just being present. and And that's it. Just knowing that this is the last time I'm going to hold that dog. One one note about that though is I I find that it's it's a good idea not to take too long. And the reason I say that is because if I stay any more than 15, really it's like 15 minutes for me, 15, 20 minutes, I just become miserable. Really miserable. Like, 
you know, everything kind of hits me at once. I'm just kind of inconsolable. You know, I, I just, it's not good for me. And the other thing is, you know, you have your medical team who still has to process your dog's body. And this is no joke, but the longer the deceased dog is is there, the heavier the dog gets and the harder it is to move. And it's, yeah, it's probably not a good idea to hang on any longer than a half hour. (laughs) Um, Just, you can... Your dog is gone at this point, and you can you can be a mess out in your car or in the comfort of your own home. So maybe you know fifteen, twenty minutes, anything longer than that is is probably not beneficial for anyone. So now, well, no, I shouldn't even say now. It should have this decision should have made beforehand. You should have decided what's going to happen with your deceased dog really before your dog is euthanized. And there are a few options. So the first one is is burying your dog on your property. Um, That, I don't think that's legal everywhere. And again, maybe I kind of live in a bubble. (laughs) You know, I, I, um, we're here in the woods, basically. We're like rural, agricultural, in the sticks kind of girl. And, you know, there's no no real ordinance is here against anything like that. So we have buried dogs on our property and um, we don't do it anymore just because of the digging and all that stuff. But you can, if your state um, or your, you know, your state, your township, your city, whatever allows it and you so choose a home burial is is appropriate. There are lots of people who do it, but you just have to make sure that it is legal. Again, check with your ordinances. Uh, there are pet cemeteries. Um, none around here, like not a one, but I do know of pet cemeteries, so that, that may be an option. Um, I do know also that there are people who choose cremation and that that is what we opt for cremation so with cremation again you have a couple of options there's a communal cremation where if you choose that it's usually a little less expensive and your dog's remains will be cremated with other dogs remains and you can choose to get ashes back or not Uh, Then there is individual cremation where your dog's remains will be cremated exclusively and you can choose to get those ashes back or not. Uh, Some people um, who choose the cremation and to get the ashes back, they, they want them so that their dog's remains can be buried with them, which is, is great. Um, We get the ashes back. We do an individual cremation. We get the ashes back. And about a couple of years ago, you know, I I had all these beautiful boxes with residents' remains um, that were cremated, and I had them in this this cabinet. And one day, I, I don't know what I was, what brought me to this, but one day I was thinking about a former resident we had named Champ, and he was fantastic. Some of you may remember him. I used to call him Champy. He was great. And Champ loved being outside. He particularly loved being up by the white pine tree um, on our property. And he would lay there. He just loved it. And I just, I remember thinking to myself, Champ would hate being in that box. If like he was conscious, he would want to be outside. And on this one beautiful, cool fall afternoon, I took all the boxes outside up by that pine tree. And there, it was a breezy day and I released all their ashes. And now that's what I do. I wait till there's about five, about five um, boxes of residents cremated remains. And on a nice day, I go and I release them right here at the sanctuary. And I mean, it's, I love it. I think it's a, it's a beautiful thing to do, but however you you choose to handle it is of course totally up to you and 
you know, it's your decision. Um, I also know there are some people who bury their dog's cremated remains and um, create a memorial for their dog. And there's there's lots of things that you you can do to memorialize your um, your dog. Again, if if you want to bury your dog or bury your dog's um, cremated remains, you could you could do a beautiful garden, a beautiful garden with a, a bench even there, so you could sit there and maybe read your book or listen to a podcast and actually be, you know, with your dog, so to speak. Um, other things people do, they create shadow boxes or plaques or beautiful artwork with pictures of their dogs and when they were born and when they were deceased and maybe a beautiful poem or something like that. Um, plant a tree. Uh, personal Personalized items, you know, mugs, ornaments, um, again, some sort of a, a plaque. So there's 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 things like that to do. Now, getting back to the hair that I was talking about, um, there's quite a few artists, especially on Etsy, that make absolutely gorgeous pendants, and and they can incorporate your dog's hair or a photo of your dog or both in the pendants or or bracelets or something like that. So you could always have a piece of your dog with you. Um, another thing you could do to memorialize your dog is you can make a donation to a rescue or shelter or sanctuary. Um, in honor of of your dog, so there's lots that you can do to memorial to memorialize your dog, and and you could you could always Google it <laughs> too, and you'll see there's a a ton of ideas, and I think all of them are pretty amazing. All right, so that's that's that is the process of euthanasia, whether you do it in home or in office. Um, so let me let me just talk about in home euthanasia. I I am like yeah. I really hope we we have that here someday or move to an area eventually that you know that is an option um, because I can I can only imagine some of the perks of in home euthanasia. First it, that comes to my mind was would be not having to take that uncomfortable ride to the vet. Um, because most of the time dogs are scared, you know, because they know they're going to the vet. And so we wouldn't have to do that. Um, they wouldn't have to, you know, be in a cold examining room on the floor. But I do have to say that that doesn't always happen with us. Um, there's been lots of times where we've just done the euthanasia right in um, my vehicle where where they think they're going for a ride and they're pretty happy about that. And I have, you know, a hammock back there that they're in and blankets that they're they're cuddled in, their blankets and stuff like that. And um I'll actually get in the back seat with them. And they just they don't ever even have to enter the the veterinarian office. So that's that's an option too. Yeah, so they don't have to go in the examining room um, cause I know that happens quite a bit and, you know, also they're hearing noise from other uh, dogs and pets at the, the veterinary clinic, which could really make them scared and uneasy. Um, it's also easier for dogs who have degenerative myelopathy, you know, who are immobile. That's, that's a big perk right there. Um, of course they're in, you know, the surroundings of their own home. So they're, they're comfortable. Uh, if there's any other pets in the home, any other dogs and whatnot, they could they could be a part of it too. I mean, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what, dogs know, and cats they know death, they know it, and I have seen it with my own two eyes when we've had a, two residents die here at the sanctuary on their own accord, without having to be euthanized, and of course the other residents, um. They all sniffed. They all came up and sniffed, and one by one, they just sniffed and walked away and didn't even look back. And then here, the other dogs don't go searching for the deceased dog. They understand. So that's nice. And also, it's private. It's private. You know, you don't have to talk with anybody if you don't want to. You can, if you just want to ugly cry, you can ugly cry without having to see anybody or talk to anybody and you know, if you want to just 
curl up on your sofa like a in a ball for the rest of the day, that's fine too. Um, some of the cons that I could see is it, it is more costly. Um, I, I have checked it out. It's not, you know, that I haven't checked it out. It's definitely more costly, but it is a convenience, one that I think is well worth it. So you are paying for that. Um, you also have have to wait for like a, a pet crematory to pick your dog up if you're not going to bury your dog, which I think could kind of be unsettling and uncomfortable, especially if you have small children who don't understand what's um, what's going on. So so there's that. But I think um, the in-home euthanasia definitely outweighs going um, to the office for an in-office euthanasia. So I don't know if that was like really technical. It just sounded really dry, and I apologize for that. But there's no real way to put a cheeky spin on, you know, the process of euthanasia. Um. The bottom line is you are most likely going to grieve and mourn the loss of your dog when it's over. And that's something I'm going to be talking about in next week's podcast episode, and that's going to be the last podcast episode for this season. So just just to say real quick right now, it, it's it's perfectly normal and natural to be upset and emotional um, your dog is, for most people, a, the dog is a family member. It's, it's, for a lot of people, it's one of their most favorite family members and their, their, their death is, is traumatic and, and, you know, just as upsetting as if they lost a, a human family member. And there's, you know, nothing wrong with that. If that's the way you feel, I feel that way. I mean, I spend most of my time with the Woody's Place dogs. And when one of them dies, it feels like a major loss to me. All right. So it's important to go through that mourning and grieving process and not just to brush it under the rug and also not to let anyone minimize it and say something to the effect of it was just a dog. Because to me, that's like a kick kick to the gut. And that'll get my hackles up for sure. (laughs) So we're going to get into that next week, folks. But that's all I have for you for this week. I'm sure there are plenty of you have who have gone through the um, euthanasia process, maybe with a previous dog, but I'm sure there are some of you who have not and don't know what to expect. So I hope this helps shed some light on euthanasia and the process of it. And um, it is definitely a personal experience and different for everyone um, in terms of what, what you're feeling and, and it's all okay. All right. So listen, give your pup a giant hug. All right. Give your pup a giant hug. Tell them I said hi. And until next time, be well.